ahead and open up your Bibles if you have them with you to uh, the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10 is going to be our, our text this morning. While you find your, your way there, I want to just kind of ask a, a question, um, kind of get the, the juices flowing this morning. It might seem like a, an obvious answer, but um, I think it's one that bears uh, pondering. The question is this, what is the gospel? I think it's a term that gets that's thrown around. Um, it's very popular in evangelicalism today to throw out terms like being gospel-centered, being gospel-driven, and these are good things. We want to be a, a church that is centered on the gospel, but I think we've maybe uh, lost sight of it or maybe we don't ponder just what is the gospel. The term itself isn't particularly... Uh, Christianized or, or religious as a, where it comes from. It simply just means good news. And in antiquity, in ancient times, what that means is that a herald would come riding into town in every Middlesex village and farm and would proclaim news from the city square, perhaps from the king or the emperor or whatever. Perhaps there was a, a great victory in uh, some remote corner of the empire, or perhaps uh, the birth of, of the king's heir, and this news needed to be proclaimed. It needed to get to the ears of the people. And so it's not particularly religious in nature, but that's the, the imagery that the writers of the New Testament, they, they really capitalized and they grasped that, and that is what they decided to call the best news ever delivered to humankind. But that doesn't really answer our question. What is the gospel? What is the content of this good news? If you've ever shared the gospel with an unbeliever, how did that go? Where do you start with? And just as kind of a preclude to our message this morning, there's just four brief points that you need to cover to make sure that you tell them the full gospel. You've got to start with God. God is the creator of everything. That means that he owns everything. That means that he owns you and me. That means that we owe him our allegiance. We owe him our fealty. So that's the first point of the gospel, this good news. It's God. Secondly, there's man. There's you and I. We've broken his law. We've rebelled against him. And as a result, we all deserve death. That is the penalty for rebellion against this creator, this king of the universe. We deserve death. The third point is Christ. As we sang about, he came to earth. He became one of us to die the death that you and I deserve. That's the good news. The rest of it is backdrop. You have to know that. The good news is Christ. But you can't stop there. The fourth and final point of, of a biblical gospel is sinners. You and I, sinners. In light of this good news, you must repent. You must turn from your wickedness and cling to Christ. This is the gospel. This is the best news that any man has ever heard, that anyone has ever proclaimed. This is the gospel. And because we want the world to know this, sometimes we're tempted to make it more acceptable, make it more palatable. People don't like to be called sinners. People don't like to be called wretched, wicked, vile but yet that's the truth of it. People don't like this idea of repenting, this idea of submitting to a cosmic king. But the gospel, this good news, this best news, is by definition exclusive. And by exclusive, I don't mean it's only for special people. I don't mean that it's a room off to the side with a velvet rope across it. What I mean by exclusive is that you cannot accept the benefits of this good news, eternal life, on your own terms. 
You cannot come here according to your own way, according to your own desires. The way is narrow, and there are few who find it, our Lord said in Matthew 7. The gospel is exclusive in that way. When men are tempted to say, you're not that bad, you're not wicked and vile. When they say that you don't actually owe God your allegiance, you don't owe him your fealty. When they say you don't necessarily have to repent, you don't have to drop and walk away from your wicked life, you just need to be sincere in what you believe. What is happening is that the gospel, this good news is being cheapened. And it's robbing it of any power to save. This exclusive nature of the gospel is what gives it its beauty. The idea that I cannot save myself, and yet I know the one who can and the one who did. This exclusive nature is actually the beauty of the gospel. And we're going to see that on display in our, in our text this morning. Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 through 22 are going to have our attention this morning. This is a text that is, this is a gospel text. This is a text that I hope will enrich our understanding of our Savior. His unbending demand for loyalty and yet his genuine compassion concern and love for the lost. We are going to see both of these on display. This text is going to sharpen our understanding of evangelism, this this idea that we can never give only half the picture. We must tell the full story of this good news. We can never leave a sinner to be comfortable in their sin. We can never end it without a call to repentance. But at the same time, we can never not love them. This isn't something done without genuine love and concern for the individual. These are people that we are talking to and talking about. And this is a text that is going to solidify our understanding of the gospel, this exclusive nature of it. Just to give a little bit of context, where we're at in Jesus' ministry in this uh, this part of Mark, this is Jesus' final approach to Jerusalem. This isn't in Galilee up in the north. This isn't even in Judea. He's on the east side of the Jordan River in a place called Perea. Just like King David of old, the final approach of our king will be from across the Jordan. The cross in Calvary is not weeks, it's days away. This is the latter part of Jesus' ministry on earth. And with that, just as kind of a a background, setting the stage, read with me, starting in verse 17, Mark chapter 10. As he, that is, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What we've just read is a a conversation between our Lord and the notorious man that you probably know as the rich young ruler. Really, it's an account that's found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's really by combining them that we come up with that term, rich, young ruler. The only identity we find here in Mark is the idea that he had much property. We get the fact that he is a ruler and that he is young from kind of combining that with the, with the other Gospels. But I want us to understand this conversation. 
We're going to go through it point by point, kind of frame by frame, exchange by exchange. And after we come to a good and accurate understanding of exactly what's being said here in this conversation, I want to give some clear implications that I think this text demands. The first point of this conversation is is really a request. Do you see the request there in verse 17? Jesus is about to leave town. And this, this unidentified man comes up, he comes up running, he comes bowing, and he comes asking. I want to take a look at each one of these actions in turn. Men of the first century did not run for really any reason unless to save life or limb. And that kind of translates into even modern cultures. I had a, a very good friend in, in seminary from Spain who did not run for any reason, even when crossing a busy Los Angeles street. He did not (laughs) run. Um, Going anywhere with him was always an adventure. He would rather be a hood ornament on a Mack truck than suffer the indignity of running across the street. And If I just admit I'm a little girl, may I run across the street? (laughs) He would have none of that. But really this, uh, not only is this, this, immature, not only is it undignified, how did people in the ancient Near East dress in the first century? Long robes, basically a dress for men and women. Um, And if you're going to run, you're going to have to kind of gather up your skirts and then expose your legs. And now you've just added to the indignity of this this act of running. So the fact that this guy comes running up is, is not a throwaway detail. There's a sense of urgency here, possibly a, a positive sign. He comes bowing. I'm, I'm, I'm reading out of the, the New American Standard. It says knelt before him, but really the idea is full prostration. He's bowing down before them. And this is not something that is done just randomly. This isn't a replacement for the shaking of hands. He's coming humbly. He's acknowledging that Jesus is someone worth bowing before this is a, this is showing contrition humility especially when taken with who this man is remember he is a ruler probably what that has in mind is, is some sort of synagogue official he's an elder if not a, a full blown pharisee he's one in the making this is a man who would be well respected a man who would be highly educated a man who would be thoroughly religious and yet he's approaching Jesus with urgency and with respect all good signs all good signs and he comes asking now this is interesting it, it is to me hopefully it is to you too the grammar here is a little different Mark is kind of painting a picture with the idea of this this running and with this bowing. He's not really putting any sort of time reference on it. He just wants to paint a picture. This is the mode in which this guy came. He came running and he came bowing. He just wants to set the scene. But with this asking, the tense that he's using is really one that keeps on going. The idea is that he did not just ask this question once. He did not phrase it once. He kept asking Jesus. Look at verse 17. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Again, there's urgency here. He kept asking. He did not phrase it just once. And really, the the question's a good question, right? Most super secular people that you run into need convincing that eternal life exists, that there's something beyond this experience, that you're not just meat for the worms, but not this guy. He knows that eternal life exists. He knows Daniel 12.2, an Old Testament passage that speaks of the resurrection of all men, some to eternal life and some to eternal torment and damnation but the resurrection of all men. He knows that eternal life exists. He doesn't need to be convinced of this. Really, the concept of inheriting eternal life is not a bad analogy. What do you, what do, you do to inherit earthly possessions? 
it's really more about who you know than what you know in order to inherit. So that's, that's not a bad analogy. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And frankly, I don't even want to pick on the fact that he asks, what shall I do as if he can earn it? He just wants to know, how can I make sure that I'm in line to inherit this gift of eternal life? These are all positive steps. His approach to Jesus is is noteworthy. It's noble. His question is on target. If you've ever done any sort of cold evangelism on the street or going door to door, you are praying for a guy like this. I mean, he came to Jesus, right? He didn't even go asking. You know, he approached Jesus asking these questions. I mean, this should be in the bag. And yet, Jesus meets this guy's question with a rebuke. That's really the second exchange that we're seeing here, is a rebuke. Look at verses 18 and 19 again. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Why does our Lord respond like this? Why does he respond with a rebuke? And make no mistake, everything in verses 18 and 19 is a rebuke. The divine nature of Christ is, is so implicit here. This man comes running up to Jesus, and he does so with some very faulty presuppositions. We all come with with an understanding or a presupposition. The question is, are your presuppositions accurate? And this man comes with some faulty presuppositions. What we might just forgive as a slip of the tongue, Jesus capitalizes it. He takes it because he knows this man's heart. He knows this man's intentions. We cannot do that. But Jesus, being God of very God, knows this man's heart. He knows the intentions behind this. And so he capitalizes on this cue that, that we're about to see here. It all centers around this word, good. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now let's just be clear here. Jesus is not denying his deity. If you doubt that, just read the rest of the New Testament. On many occasions, Christ makes naked claims to be no one but God. His followers and everyone that wrote the New Testament understood that, and it's implicit all over and explicit all over the pages of Scripture. So that's not what's going on here. He's not denying his deity. What he's doing is he's forcing this man to come to the term with the fact that his idea of goodness is subjective. The subjective view of goodness, and quite frankly, this is something that we're all guilty of. We speak of goodness as if it's something on a sliding scale, as if there's actually degrees of goodness. You walk into any retail store, any retail, it doesn't matter whether they're selling shoes or mattresses or cars, what they're going to do is show you a line of products that is good, better, and best, right? as if there's actually a degree, a sliding scale of goodness. But that defies the very nature of what is good, the definition of good. Good cannot be improved upon. If something is good, it is without fault. It is pure. It's, it's unblemished. It is whole, as in complete, without defect. By nature, good can have but a single standard. And Jesus identifies that standard as being God alone. This man uses the term somewhat flippantly. Now, why is that so important? It's just a slip of the tongue, right? If he's willing to use this term so loosely on a man that he knows only by reputation, what's his opinion of himself? 
How do you suppose he estimates his own goodness on this fictitious sliding scale? If you were to ask anyone on the street, are you a good person? What's the, what's the answer? Of course, of course I'm a good person. Why? Why are you a good person? Well, I don't cuss, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do, right? <laughs> that is not an argument for goodness. That is simply a comparative argument suggesting that you're not as bad as that guy. That's not an argument for goodness. Goodness is a single standard. Now, evil has varying degrees. Our own justice system recognizes that. We don't punish a pickpocket the same way that we would a serial killer. Both bad, right? Both not good. But that does not give the pickpocket a claim to goodness simply because he's not a serial killer. The implication and application is really obvious. What method of goodness do we use to identify ourselves? The actual, firm, singular definition of goodness being God alone or something so arbitrary that we contrive in our own minds? How do we determine our own goodness? Really, that's what the Ten Commandments are all about. How do they start off? How does the Ten Commandments start off? No other gods, you will have no idols, you will not profane the name of God. Really, that whole first half of the Ten Commandments, what that deals with is God's vertical relationship with mankind. I am your God, and this is going to define our relationship. The second half, deals with a horizontal relationship man to man. Here's how that works. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if that is true, if that actually exists, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. Kind of like what we were speaking about in Sunday school this morning. This is the fruit that proves the existence of this faith. If you do indeed love the Lord your God, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. Any breakdown in this horizontal relationship betrays the fact that there is something already broken with this vertical. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. That's exactly why he takes him straight to the second half of the commandments, not the first half, because he's going to, how do you prove that? How do you prove, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Of course I do. Let's see. Let's see. And so Jesus takes him straight to the second half of the commandments. You know the commandments. Even that statement is a rebuke. There's two words that can be translated to know in the Greek language. One of them has with it the idea of an experiential knowledge. More than just intellect, something that you experience. Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. Experiential. You can't know something more intimately than that. The other word is simply, you've read it, you know it, not necessarily on an experiential level, but you should know this. That's the word that Mark is using here in quoting Jesus. You haven't actually experienced these commandments, but at least you've read them. You know the commandments, my young Pharisee in training. Even the order that Jesus gives them is, is significant. This is not the same order that we read them in Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5. Jesus really lays these out in an increasing intensity. Now, we know that the commandments are more than just external, right? That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. You have heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you that if you have hate in your heart for your brother, you are guilty of murder. 
You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed that. It's more than just externals. It's really reflecting a heart issue. But even if we were to lay that aside, just for the sake of argument, this man might be able to check off a few of these. If this is a list that he has to check off, maybe a few, but there's no way he's going to be able to make it all the way down, even if we lay aside the whole heart issue. Never killed anyone. Good. Check. Never cheated on my wife. Good. Check. Never stole. You never stole anything. Really? Even time from your employer? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing every minute that you're clocked in? Never lied. Even as a child, because that counts. <laughs> really? Never dishonored your father and mother. Really? No one can live up to this standard, even if we're going to just live in the realm of the external, which that's not supposed to do. This is an internal heart issue, but even if you actually live in the external realm, no one can live up to the standard, and that is the entire point. He's showing this man just how bankrupt his worldview is. He's showing him how bankrupt his standard of goodness really is. But rather than admitting defeat, this guy challenges Jesus' rebuke. He has a rebuttal. Look at verse 20. And he said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. This is a contrasting idea. This is an objection. This is a rebuttal to what Jesus has just said reading the NAS, really uh, starting this out should be a but rather than an and. But he said to him, this is a contrasting idea. I'm not sure if any of you are following along with the, the, the NIV, the New International Version, but it begins this word with teacher in quotes, he declared. And I like that. It kind of captures this idea of an interjection, an objection, and an, an, an assertion. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time picking apart this objection, this rebuttal. I just want to make a couple of points. One of them obvious, one of them not so much. The obvious point that I think we need to get through this is that even if we're, again, leaving the heart issue aside, this guy's a flat-out liar. I've kept all these things from my youth up. No, you haven't. That's the whole idea. The purpose of the law is to reveal man's utter inability to keep it and drive them to repentance. This man is actually, factually claiming righteousness inherent in, in of himself. There is none righteous, right? No man has done good, no not one. Romans 3, right? But Paul, in writing Romans, is actually quoting from the Psalms. Psalms that this guy should know because he's a religious leader, right? He should know his Old Testament. He knows Daniel 12 too. Why is he ignoring these Psalms? He's claiming exemption is what he's doing. He does not understand his own depravity. Now for the, the second point that may not be quite as obvious. Did you notice the change in address here? No longer good teacher. Just teacher. He understood that this was a rebuke but he completely missed the reason for it. Really what he's doing, he's doubling down on his own claim to goodness. And in doing so, he's rejecting the ultimate standard of goodness in the flesh standing before him. He is denying Christ.
Christ's deity. He is rejecting the royalty before him. He is missing Messiah right in front of him. He doesn't get it. Jesus' rebuke, rather than triggering repentance, is really just triggering a rebuttal, an objection. And really, it's the grace of our Lord that is so evident in what happens next. If this were you and I, what would happen right about now? We're so frustrated with this guy who is so dense. This man's self-righteousness is laid bare for everyone to see, except him. Jesus is going to grant this man a very short, but a very real reprieve. He's going to allow, he's not going to allow him to remain comfortable in his self-righteousness. That is not an option. This man must see who he is, and so Graciously, this is a mirror put right before him. He is incapable of looking down and seeing his own wretchedness. And so in a reprieve, our Lord is going to show this man precisely who he is. Look at verse 21. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. I think it's interesting that Jesus is not a debater here. He is not out to win an argument. He's not out to win points. And I think that's a lot of the time what, through the best of intentions, evangelism can turn into. We're just going to argue the point to see who has the best intellectual argument. But that's not what Jesus is doing here. This man's blindness is apparent to everyone but himself. And so Jesus looks at him and loves him. This is astounding to me. I would be so frustrated with this individual, but not not our Lord the tomb that this man is must be stripped of its whitewash. We see the results. Excuse me. It must be stripped of its whitewash. But not out of spite, not out of frustration, out of compassion. This man must see who he really is. Jesus looks at him, he loves him, and he says to him, one thing you lack. I feel silly saying it, but I feel like I have to. Holiness is not gained through poverty. I think we should just go ahead and say that here. You are not more holy for having a lower bank account, which is unfortunate because many of us would be very holy then. But what Jesus is doing here, he's laying his finger on this man's mortal wound. He's pointing out this man's idol. The whole point of walking this man through that second half of the Ten Commandments was to show him face to face that he never even came close to keeping the first half. You don't love God. You love your wealth. This is your idol. You must get rid of it. You must forsake it and you must come and follow me. This is not the first time Jesus has spoken in this manner. He who loves mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10:37. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 27. This is what repentance looks like. There is no room for sitting on the fence. It is identifying what you hold more dear than Almighty God, forsaking it, turning around, 
and following Christ. Don't be mistaken. Discipleship costs. It costs everything. If there's something you are not willing to depart with, then you have found your idol. You have found your God. You have found your standard of goodness. This man had to come to grips with it. Jesus so graciously granted this, this, this reprieve. It's a hard truth that he's saying, but he does so with grace, he does so with love, but he reveals the ugly truth. How is this truth received? Not well. Not well. We see the results of this conversation in verse 22. But at these words, he was saddened. He went away grieving. For he was one who owned much pro property. He went away grieved. There's, there's absolutely no indication that this man ever repented. Really, the grammar indicates that he was one who kept on owning property. He never forsook it. He refused to let go of his idol. He came in the right manner. He came to the right person. He asked the right question, and of course, he received the right answer. We would accept, expect nothing less from our God and our Savior and our King. But he could not accept the exclusivity of it. The gospel is exclusive in its demand. Now, we've, we've looked at the request, the rebuke, the rebuttal, the reprieve, the results of this conversation. And I just want to leave you with three truths that this text demands that we know. First and foremost, you must have an accurate understanding of Christ. There is no room for error here. This Christ... Though he existed in the form of God, he did not cling to it, but emptied himself to the form of a slave, a bondservant, obeying the Father's will to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is our standard of goodness. Not the little man that the Romans leave hanging on the cross. Not the, the good prophet, half-brother of Lucifer. This is our Christ. This is our God. If you confess this one as master, as Lord, as sovereign, and believe that God raised him from the dead, then you will share in that resurrection. You must know this Christ. This Christ. Secondly, you must have an accurate understanding of yourself. You're not good. This is not your standard of goodness. Contrary to popular opinion, you are evil. You're a rebel against God, a breaker of his law, a deserver of death for your sedition against the king. All of our righteousness what we would call righteousness, are but filthy rags before our God. Which is really a natural lead into our third and final truth that we must understand. As a rotten, evil sinner, we must repent. Repent. Repent means that there is a change in direction, a change in attitude, a change in worldview. Really, we must do what this man failed to do. Casting away whatever it is that you're clinging to, whatever your assurance is in, if it's anything other than the finished work of Christ. 
you must throw it away and you must cling to him. This, this is the gospel. It is so exclusive. Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. There will be none who come to the Father but through him. The gospel is exclusive. Would you pray with me in closing? Oh, Father, we just thank you so much for this good news. We thank you for your Son that makes it possible to be your child. Lord, I pray for this body, this church, that they would embrace this wonderful message, both personally, in a saving manner, and also that they would go forth and continue to proclaim it as they work, as they live alongside so many that desperately need to hear this good news, Father. We love you and we pray to serve you well this day, tomorrow, and until you come in your glory and in your kingdom. In your precious and holy name, amen.